We've been studying Tuesday nights through the Gospel of John, and last week we finished chapter 5. So how many of you read chapter 6 for this week? Look at you overachievers. I didn't even tell you to do that, and you did it, and I'm so proud of you. And that's really good because uh, I think I'm going to do something a little different tonight. We'll see. But it feels good to me because, like, the pace that we've been going, I mean, we started this thing in February, and we just finished, like, five chapters. That's really slow. You should never read the Bible that slow. And I'm telling people all the time, like, like read, like gobble it up big chunks because it helps you to get all the pieces that much easier to begin putting them together to see like the, the, the macroscopic, the big picture ideas um, of what God's trying to teach us um, through his word. And there's like a thousand other ways you can consume the Bible in like one verse at a time and meditate all day on that. And like, we don't need more of that, but it seems like we really don't have a lot of opportunities um, at church to like do bigger picture, bigger overview things. So I'm gonna try to do tonight is try to do all of chapter six in one night. And if you look at chapter six, that's a lot. There's no way I can go verse by verse through this. Um, But it's, and the reason I wanna do this is because, you know, I did it last week. We spent three weeks on chapter five and I had to stop and spend like 10 minutes putting all the pieces back together so that you could see the Apostle John, like how he has designed that, that section of the gospel to all fit together and, and go cohesively together. And six is even longer. I could spend probably six weeks on chapter six, and I have to spend at least one of those just trying to put all the pieces back together for you so you can see what's just right there on the page if we just went through it all at once. Does it make sense? So I don't know. It's an experiment. Maybe it's this is going to be drinking from the fire hose. We'll find out. But I don't know. I just at least one time wanted to show you what it was like to go like take a whole chapter and just like boom, see how it all fits together. So this is my quick summary outline of the gospel, the whole gospel of John, just to kind of put where we're talking about tonight in context of the bigger picture. So the gospel of John has sort of, it has a a, a prologue, um, really kind of has two prologues, I should as like prologue one and prologue two and then he goes into like dissecting the first seven days um of you know we meet jesus and we spend these first seven days with him as he's meeting um his first disciples and they're beginning to follow him and then we have these four different um encounters between jesus and these very jewish symbols and and we see how jesus encounters these things and he transforms Um, their meaning or clarifies their meaning to be about himself and then after that and this section is is all contained um, with this place called Cana we start off in Cana and we end up in Cana by the end of this and so that kind of is our bookends for this section and it ends with this miraculous healing um, of an official son who the son is near death he's not dead but he's as close to death as you can get and not be dead. And Jesus is able to heal him with a word. And that's important. Uh, Jesus is doing a lot of things with word. Um, and in the midst of this, we get, there's, uh, r- the very first thing that we see here is this uh, sign number one, Jesus turning the water into wine. You guys remember that? It was so many months ago. But John tells us, this was the first sign. And then when we get to the healing of that uh, official son, John tells us, and this was the second sign. And after that, John isn't going to count for you anymore. He expects you to, you know, be mature and count for yourself now how many signs he's going to give us. And so then we get into this next section, which begins in chapter 5 and goes through uh, the end of chapter 10. And our, our key word that, that bookends this um, depends on your English translation. It'll um, get rendered different ways in English, but it's portico or colonnades or however they chose to translate that. But it's it's a place of columns and it starts off there and it's going to end back there. And then within that, oh, look, we have four more things. Only instead of symbols, they're actually Jewish feasts 
or Jewish holy days that Jesus transforms or informs the people like what they're really about and they're about him. Um, and the very first thing, once again, we get another sign. And that was our chapter five. And that was sign number three, which was the healing of the, the lame man at the pool. And so then moving forward this, I'm, I'm going to like have to spoil stuff here. I'm so sorry, but hopefully you've read the gospel of John before. So there's going to be seven of these signs that he's going to talk about. And in fact, tonight in chapter six, um, we're going to get sign number four. And then uh, in chapter nine, which is going to be back in here, we're going to get sign number five. And then during these last seven days of Jesus's life, before the two epilogues, we're going to get sign um, number six and sign number seven at the very, very end. Now, the sixth they tell us is a sign. John actually doesn't tell us the seventh one is a sign at the end of the gospel. He's actually told us that way in the beginning, because what's the seventh sign? Who remembers that? We talked about this so long ago. What's the seventh sign in John's gospel? It's the resurrection. It's the resurrection, the empty tomb. That's the last sign. And Jesus told us way back in chapter two when they asked him for a sign, the only sign you're getting is the sign of Jonah. And, and so, or no, he said, no, I'm sorry, that's a different gospel. Um, in John, he says, uh, tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. That's the sign you're getting. And that's exactly what happens um, at the end of the gospel. And that's sign number seven. And so people who have been with us all this time know that... Um, I just keep using this word every week called chiasm and talking about the literary structure of John. And something that I, I realized this week as I was thinking about this is that the signs themselves are a chiasm. <laughs> because sign, sign number uh, three and five go together. They're, they're very much parallel passages. The lame man and then sign number five will be this, this man who was born blind. And it clearly meant for you to hold these two um, uh, scenes side by side and compare and contrast both the person that was healed, how they responded, the way Jesus healed them, the reasons why they needed healing. Like all of these things are very clearly meant um, to be placed side by side and thought about. Um, sign number two and sign number six, very clearly supposed to be parallel. Number two is what ends the, this uh, section, and number six is what kicks off this section. Number two is healing of an official son, again, who was on the point of death. Like, John makes it really clear. Like, as close to death as you could be, and Jesus is able to heal them. And sign number six is Lazarus, who's been dead how many days when Jesus gets to him? three days, right? So that's pretty dead. It's like, it's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not like you could say, oh, well, his heart stopped, but you know, Jesus came in and did CPR and resuscitated, you know, brought him back to life. Like, no, I mean, he was entombed. Like he was dead, dead. They were worried about the smell when they opened up the tomb so that Jesus could get at him. Um, and so clearly like this is, you know, if you thought that was cool, then it's like, you get to sign number six. It's like, oh yeah, Jesus can heal people on either side of the point of death, and it becomes a big deal. And in John's gospel, it becomes the deal that, that ultimately puts the target on Jesus' back with the authorities, that they, they just absolutely cannot s tolerate his existence anymore, and he must die. Because if this guy can raise the dead, then like, we're hosed. Like, how do you fight that? Like, you know, and so they've got to get rid of him. And so clearly these two go together, which is interesting because then it means, you know, the water to wine and the resurrection are meant to be paralleled, which makes sense suddenly, right? Why Jesus was so upset when his mother told him, you know, hey, you gotta do something about this. And he's like, it's not my time yet. Cause he knows this is the sign he's about to do is this time proclaiming his death and resurrection. And so, you know, take that back and go back and reread, you know, the, the wedding at Cana and, and just see what the Lord speaks to you. So I point all this out to say, well, what does that make sign number four? It makes it the bullseye in this chiasm. We've talked about before, when you have these patterns in the Bible, and they're all over the Hebrew Bible, um, 
where it's like almost counting down to something and then counts back again. Um, the thing that's at the center is just highlighted. It's, it's, it's boldened, it's italicized, it's put in the biggest font you can get. Like it's meant for you to really ponder it and, and understand why this becomes the center that everything else revolves around it. So that makes the, the sign that we get to tonight in chapter six, like nothing, it's not something we wanna just pass over quickly. Like we wanna think about it and, and understand why is this the sign that's placed at the center of this gospel and and what is john trying to say to us about jesus and who he is and 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 what his life and death mean to us these are questions that that should be popping in our heads and so what is uh john chapter six well you know, i think oh it's not a big deal it's you know jesus feeds the five thousand which is one of the only things that's in like all four different gospel accounts. And so, oh, so John thought he had to write about it too then, huh? Um, no, John has been, John really stands apart from the other three in so many different ways. And he clearly doesn't feel compelled to retell you stuff that the other apostles have already told in their gospels. Um, we don't know for sure if John had read Luke or Matthew but it seems like people who have done analysis and study and spent whole lives and careers doing this stuff, pretty certain that John, at the very minimum, was familiar with Mark's gospel. Um, and it, just by the kind of the interplay, the times that, that John mentions things that are in Mark, he seems to be adding another uh, angle to the event or more back information, or sometimes in how he just skips over things as if you already know that because you read Mark's gospel and I don't need to tell you again. But when he goes and spends the time to retell you an event in more detail that Mark also told us about in detail, that's significant. He, he doesn't have to do that. So he clearly considers this a very significant moment in the, the earthly ministry of Jesus, which should prompt us to ask ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us, like, why is that? Why is this... Um, seen so significant. So, man, I'm just going to read, and then we're going to talk about it. So, let's just read the first part here. So, John 6, verse 1. After this, which is a funny way to transition, right? Because the how did we, in the last chapter, um, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, accusation came against him, he gave a defense, he provided three, the testimony of three witnesses, and then brought his own accusation against the leaders who were accusing him. And then John just goes on. And then after this, like, we don't hear, like, how did that resolve? What did the leaders say? Like, none of that. We're just moving on. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So he was in Jerusalem. Now we're all the way back north in Galilee. Um, which John tells us is the Sea of, of Tiberias. It was, it was called Tiberias, probably not called that in Jesus's day, but would have been called that when John is writing his gospel um, because of the, uh, the city that was named after uh, the Roman emperor Tiberius that was there on the, uh, the west or the eastern side of the sea. Um, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Okay, and I have to stop there. It, when you're reading this gospel, like we're only in chapter six, so if you're actually sitting down to read it at home, and it, it, it was only a few pages ago that you were in John chapter two, and I, I, I say this a lot, always look for repeated phrases because the, the author is tying things together and causing you to reflect on something that's happening now in light of this other thing that has already happened. And so when I'm you know, reading straight through the gospel and I see large crowd following him because they saw signs that he was doing on the sick, it makes me think about the end of John chapter 2, right after the, the temple stunt. And it says, uh, this is John 2.23, now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people 
and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And so it becomes this thing, like there's this massive popularity spike for Jesus. People are flocking to him, but, but John is very quick to tell us as Jesus' popularity first starts to spike, that, that Jesus wasn't, what, what they were selling, he wasn't buying. He wasn't interested in popularity. He wasn't interested in, in all these people that were quote unquote believing in him. He didn't believe in them. He understood exactly what they were there for, why they were following him, what they wanted, and it wasn't what he was there to give them. And so when we see that repeated phrase, like these people following him because they saw the signs that he was doing, we should be predisposed to think in our minds, oh, that's actually not a good thing. That's actually not a good thing that people are doing this because these people have the, they're approaching him with the wrong motivation. And so then we should be asking ourselves as we're reading, oh, I wonder what Jesus is going to do. Because so far in the story, Jesus has been saying a lot of wildly socially inappropriate things to people um, who approach him with wrong motivations or from, you know, wrong, wrong stance, whatever. Um, and it says, Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. And so it seems like Jesus is trying to get away from people. And if we've read Mark's gospel, which I think John expects us to have, then we know that's exactly what was going on. Jesus was, had gone from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other to get away from the crowds, was trying to have a retreat with his disciples, but the people have followed him. They went along the north side of the lake and they're, they're seeking him out and there's the crowds, right? And Mark tells us um, something that, that John doesn't, but that John comes back and, and emphasizes that point also, but we'll get back to it. So the Passover feast of the Jews was at hand. So again, we're at that Passover time. And lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And we're told, he said this to test him, that is for Jesus to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. So he's asking, it's like, okay, this is, he's trying to spend some quality time with his disciples to pour into them, you know, life on life. Here comes the crowds, right? And so Jesus is like, okay, this is, our, our little retreat has been wrecked, but we could still use this as a teaching moment. Okay, Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? What do you think? And Philip answers him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little, a little. And how much is a denarii? Anyone knows their like Bible currency? It's like a day's wages, right? So 200, about eight months salary for an average person so that everyone could have a little nibble of bread. That's a lot of money <laughs> for a little bit of bread. Um, and one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And so um, we already know, you know, if we're familiar with this story, yeah. So Jesus is testing Philip. How does Philip do? swing and miss right it's just swing and miss he didn't he doesn't get it andrew thinks you know he's going to be helpful so he points out a non-solution to the problem right <laughs> well here's some food but you know that's enough maybe for us to have a nibble but these people are hosed right and so andrew you know swings and misses this is what's wild and how uh the apostle john the way he presents um, this story to us. And I don't, I can't recall for sure, so look it up yourselves. But I don't think the other gospel writers mentioned that it's barley loaves. But John, if we've not learned anything about John, is that he doesn't, he's very careful with his words. And he loves to uh, tie the events in the life of Jesus that he experienced alongside Christ um, to well-known 
stories and motifs in the Hebrew Bible. And so when you say barley, loaves, and you talk about people not having enough to eat, there's this particular story that might you know, if you were, you know, a Jewish person that, you know, was, was steeped in your scriptures, that might pop into your mind here. Does anybody know the story that has to do with barley loaves and people not having enough to eat? Um, close. So it's in 2 Kings. 2 Kings 4. And uh, has to do with Elisha. Okay. So remember that it was that whole thing when Elisha had to purify the deadly stew at the end of chapter 4 of 2 Kings, um, right? And uh, starting at verse 42, it says, A man came from Baal Shalishah, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, of barley. That's an interesting detail and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give it to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. Remember that detail. That's going to come in later. So he said it before them, and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. And so you have this um, story here with the prophet and barley loaves and food being left over, right? Could that have any tie-in to what Jesus is about to do at all? Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, right? But except there's a thing here, there's something going on here because... With that, I mean, that guy had it seemed like 20 barley loaves, so that should, should be enough. I mean, it's still amazing that they didn't think there would be any left over, and yet God said there would be and there was, right? But this is even less. Is Jesus greater than Elisha? Let's see, right? Like, that's what, that's what Jesus is inviting his disciples to question in their mind, because they certainly know these stories. I mean, these stories of Moses and Elijah and Elisha, I mean, these are like, they're, they're cultural and spiritual heroes. And now here they are in the same, some of the similar circumstances, only that Jesus is asking them to trust that he's actually greater than all their heroes put together. And so let's see what happens. Jesus says, have the people sit down, which, you know, if you've been in the Middle East, that's like our favorite way to enjoy a meal like this is you're not going to sit down to have a nibble of bread by the way like the fact that jesus is telling them like it's setting the stage like sit down we're about to have a banquet you know everybody's going to sit down on on blankets on the ground they're going to be leaning against each other huddled up in groups the way we like to eat in the middle east right and it says now there was much grass in this place which probably make it very comfortable and so the men sat down about five thousand in number and if you're wondering, why do they only care about the men, right? And, you know, other people have theorized that probably if you count the women and the children that were probably there, it's close to be 20,000 people. So why, why don't they say that? Why don't they make a bigger deal that Jesus fed, how many people Jesus actually fed instead of just talking about how many men? Well, we're going to get to that because there's a reason why. So just then, Jesus took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. And so also the fish, as much as they wanted, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign, so this is sign number four, that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force 
to make him king, Jesus withdrew again into the mountain by himself. So what's, what's going on here? So John, the Apostle John, has already set us up in the very beginning of the story. And if we, we understand uh, the, the, the life of, of a Jewish person in the first century, it would jump right out to us. If we're not as familiar um, with Jewish traditions of, that are part of our heritage, then maybe we miss over it. What, what time of the year is this? Passover. Is Passover a big deal to the people in Israel? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. It's bigger than the 4th of July. It is. It's a huge deal, right? And it's what's so when you're a Jewish person and you're thinking about Passover, what story are you remembering and reliving with your family and close neighbors? The Exodus story, right? What's the Exodus story about again? Oh, yeah. People crying out for a deliverer. God redeems his people saves them through the waters to come out into the wilderness with him, to meet with him, to worship him, to make covenant with him. And during that time in the wilderness, because they're in the wilderness, do they get hungry? And does he need to feed them? And what does he give them to eat? Man, Man. what is manna? It's also called the bread of heaven, right? And they're remembering this story at this time. These people would be. And look, it's around the Passover time, and they're in the wilderness. And Jesus is giving them bread. Miraculous bread, right? But do you remember there was rules about the, the manna that they ate in the wilderness, right? What were you not allowed to do with it? Store it up. Were you allowed to keep any leftovers? No, except for the Sabbath, right? You could store up on the sixth day an extra portion for the next day. But other than that, and what happened if you broke the rule? It went bad. It got all maggoty and gross, right? It had more protein maybe, but less appealing to eat. Um, And so do you see the inversion that's happening here? Jesus is providing bread that's, that's super abundant and is meant to be saved and there's meant to be leftovers in fact there's enough left over for 12 baskets if you're a jewish person you see the number 12 what do you think about what do you think about what are there 12 of in israel 12 tribes how are the 12 tribes doing in israel right now in the moment in this story like most of them are lost right they're scattered they're in exile all over the gentile world and and the people are are crying out to god to restore to complete the return from exile they're praying for a for a second exodus from all the nations back home right they're talking about the the exodus that's in isaiah 55 What does Isaiah 55 say? I'm just going to read the the first few verses, jog our memories, right? This is what the, and see if this like jives at all with what Jesus is doing and what he's about to say to the people um, as he begins to speak to them as a whole. So this is Isaiah chapter 55, verse one. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God 
and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So John, if he hasn't made anything clear about Jesus, he's made it super, super clear from the very beginning that Jesus is the word of God. He is God and he is the word of God. And they have all of this prophecy about God visiting them, about God coming to redeem them, to bring them out of their second slavery, to bring them into in liberty and freedom again, to worship him in freedom again, to rescue them. And here it is, Passover time, and there's this Rabbi Yeshua doing this miracle. And they're really excited because they, they think they can see the signs and they think they understand who he is. But did they really understand who he is and what he's doing for them and what he's saying about himself? No, not quite. They're close, but not quite. They don't have the whole picture. You know, they call him the prophet. Who are they probably talking about? We've talked about this a few times in our study of John. When they're talking about the prophet, they're probably talking about the one Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy 18, who would come who would be even better than, according to Moses, even better than Moses, right? And they want to make him king, we're told, here at the end of this section in verse 15. Well, because, you know, Moses, in, in, in some ways, was kind of like a king for Israel. He, was, he led them. He made intercession for them. He represented the people before God and, and God before the people. But Jesus knew, knew exactly what these people were after and what they were looking for. And that's why, you know, in Mark's gospel, he adds the, the detail that when Jesus saw the crowds, he said that he had compassion on them because why? They were like sheep without a shepherd, right? And we sort of like gloss over that like, oh, Jesus just feels sorry for them because they don't have a chaperone. Like what? Like, like, think about why does he say that specifically? Sheep without a shepherd, and that causes him compassion on them, right? Well, Jesus is actually quoting his Bible, because in 1 Kings 22, um, when the prophet Micaiah was, was uh, reluctantly summoned before King Ahab to tell him whether he was going to have victory if he went up to Ramoth Gilead, and, you know, all the other prophets were like, yeah, go, you're going to win! And, you know, Micah, Micaiah tries to say the same, and then he kind of gets pressed, and he's like, fine, you win. Yeah, this is like, God wants you dead, and this is his plan to kill you. Um, and the word that God said, the vision that God gave me, and looking at your armies, Ahab, is that they are like sheep without a shepherd scattered on the mountainside. They're an army without a general. That's what that phrase means. That's what's going to happen to your people. It's talking about Ahab. So when Jesus sees the people like this, and he says they're sheep without a shepherd, he says they're an army looking for a military commander. That's what he's saying. And that's why when they, he perceives they want to make him king, he withdraws and flees away. Because that's not the kind of battle that he's come to wage. He's not, he's not come to lay siege to these rooms. And that's why, again, why the, the gospel writers make a point about the crowds having 5,000 men. 5,000 men is a legion. That's enough to go to war with. There was 5,000 people present and now well-fed that were of fighting capability. He had a small army there ready to make him their military commander and lead them into battle against the Roman occupiers. 
And Jesus is saying, that's not why I'm here. That's not what I've come to do. You've misunderstood my purpose. And so he flees. And, you know, in John's gospel, we don't know, like, do the disciples even know, like, what happened to him? Did he just vanish? Whatever. From Mark's gospel, we already know that he sends them off across the Sea of Galilee by themselves, and then he'll catch up with them later. And he's kind of vague about it, right? Well, John tells us that when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It's now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles... They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. (sighs) Do you ever wonder why the, the story of Jesus walking on the water is right after, and all the gospel accounts when it's brought up, is right after the feeding of the 5,000? Because it's the Exodus story, guys. And Jesus isn't just better than Elisha. He is better than Moses. And what it, it's interesting because there's a number of people um, in the Hebrew Bible that part the waters for God's people, right? Of course, there's Moses, super famous, right? But then after Moses, who else so is, is that, does that? Joshua, right? When they cross the Jordan, super famous thing. And then later, when Elijah shows up, and we're, as the reader in suspense, when we're first reading that story, are meant to think this might be the prophet Moses talked about because he does a lot of the same things as Moses. What does Elijah do? Parts the river, right? And we're like, wow, okay. And then we see what happens with Elijah. And we're like, okay, no, he wasn't the better than Moses guy that we're, we're still waiting And then Elisha follows him, right? And and Elisha asks for a double portion um, of everything that Elijah had. And so does Elisha get to part waters when he runs across him? Yep, he gets to do that too, right? And so you might be wondering if Jesus is better than all of these guys, where's Jesus' parting the waters moment? Jesus doesn't part the waters, he just walks on them. He just walks on them. They don't have to be divided before him so that he can walk on dry ground. He has complete authority and dominion over the waters that he can walk on them. And guess what we know from the other gospel writers? He also has the authority to invite us into that same position with him alongside him. We just, right? Okay. So we're still in the Exodus story. Good. All right. So we're going to keep going. Okay. And so the next day, the crowd that had remained on the other side of the sea, they saw there was only one boat there, and Jesus hadn't entered the boat with his disciples. But the disciples had gone away alone. So everyone's like, where's Jesus, right? We want more Jesus. He just fed us, and it was a great miracle. We want more. We want more, right? Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus wasn't there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Do you see the echoes? of Isaiah 55 and what Jesus is saying here. They they are looking at the physical. They're wanting physical uh, satisfaction. They're wanting physical relief from all. And I mean, they had some serious complaints on what was going on in their country at that time that they wanted relief from the occupation, all of those things right? They wanted all of those things. But Jesus is like, can you look beyond all of that? Can you lift your eyes up just enough to glance toward eternity and my eternal kingdom and and be looking for a place there with me? Then they said to him, what must, must we be doing 
to, to do the works of God. And Jesus answers them, this is the work of God. So pay, we need to pay attention to this. That you believe in him who he sent. And so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Like, how ridiculous is that, right? These are the same crowds that saw the miraculous. And why are they saying that? Because they, they want signs, right? They want miracles. And they like the trick with the loaves and the fishes. But, you know, what we see as we read on, what they're egging him on to do, what they're daring him, double daring him, is to make bread fall out of the sky, because wouldn't that be cool to see, right? And there was a teaching at the time, you know, because the writer of Ecclesiastes says, you know, not only is there nothing new under the sun, but everything that happened before is going to happen again. There was a teaching that when the Messiah came, he'd repeat a lot of the miracles of Moses, including bringing the bread down from heaven, like literally raining down. And they thought, wouldn't that be cool if we're the first people to see it? Like, they're just hyped up and excited to experience miracles, it says, what sign do you, will you do that we see and believe? What works do you perform? Our fa- see, and like they tell him, our fathers ate man in the wilderness. So come on, Jesus, hint, hint. Like, we want to see that. We know you can do it, right? As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he, the bread of God is a he, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give us this bread always. Like they didn't, he said he, they didn't catch it. They didn't pick up on it yet. What he's actually saying there. He's on the, the bread that you really should be searching after is not bread that you eat and get hungry again. Just like when he talked to the Samaritan at the well, the water you should be looking for is not the water you drink and get thirsty again. That's not a solution. That's a band-aid. And he says to them, now really clear, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you've seen me and yet you don't believe All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. We're still in the Exodus story. How do we know that? Verse 41, so the Jews grumbled about him. And if you know the Exodus story, you remember, right? People in the wilderness, they get manna, which is an amazing miracle. And very shortly, what do they begin to do? They begin to grumble. That becomes kind of a theme for them. They grumble about food, about wanting meat, about water. And then God spends a whole year with them at Sinai, giving them the law, making his covenant with them, all of that. And then in Numbers, when they're finally ready to move on, then we have all these stories about them grumbling about bread and meat and water and all these same things. So, yeah. And so this is like a repeat, a repeat. It's, it's the same people. It's, it's us. It's us, guys. This is, this is what we do, unfortunately. God does... a rescues us miraculously and if we don't get the specific thing that we want we grumble we're always looking at oh this is good god but i really want this this would really be the thing that would satisfy me in this moment we grumble because he says i am the bread that came because that's not what they want they want the manna they don't want this whatever weird metaphor dude that you're doing right now we want the bread coming down the frosted flakes out of the sky like that's what we want and then they said this is not jesus the son of joseph whose father and mother like a few moments you know a few days ago they were saying this is the prophet moses talked about let's make him our king and he'll lead us into battle now because they don't like what he's saying how quickly they turn how quickly their hearts turn now oh we know this guy he's a nobody he's saying he's came down from heaven jesus says to them 
Don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. And that's, remember, that's talking about, many of the prophets talk about this with different metaphors. But you know, in, in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, it, it talks about the, how God's solution to the human problem that Moses talks about at the end of Deuteronomy, that humanity has a heart condition. We, our hearts have to be circumcised. There's something there that has to be cut out, and only God can cut it out. And, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel will use different metaphors to talk about that, but have to do with God putting his spirit in us, about giving us a new heart, about taking a heart that's made out of stone and making it flesh, about taking our hearts and writing his Torah on our hearts so that we won't need anybody else, you know, we won't have to have a Bible teacher to study the Bible anymore because God himself will teach us. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's what he's offering them. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. They died, guys. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then the Jews, of course, disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Right? Because I think that there's something in the Torah about cannibalism. And who is this guy? I think he is. Why is he saying this right? And does Jesus back off on this? No. He doubles down. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's provocative. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood. How many times is he going to say that in one breath? Abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue. In the synagogue! <laughs> Just imagine that. Like scandalous, right? As he was teaching. Oh, Oh my goodness. So, that obviously they had issues with that teaching. Right? And we will have issues with that teaching too, by the way. If we just read past it as fast as we can, and we don't pause to, to actually hear every word that Jesus is saying. Because he's, he's using this uh, this metaphor of, of literally eating his, blood, eating his body and drinking his blood. But is that actually what Jesus is saying in that moment? That he's like, here's a knife and fork, guys. Bon appetit. That's not at all what he's saying, right? It sounds like that. He certainly keeps using that, that description over and over again. But he's actually said exactly what he's talking about when he says that in this very uh, message that he gives. You know, he says that um, I am the living bread in verse 51 that came down from heaven. If anyone eats the bread, he'll live forever, right? And the bread I'm giving you is for the world, life of the world is my flesh, right? But if you look a few verses up from that, he says, tr verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And at the end of the thing, he's talking about eating, eating flesh, drinking blood, eating flesh, drinking blood, eating flesh, drinking blood. And then he says, um, this is in verse 56, 
Um, Whoever is feeding on my flesh and drinking of my blood abides in me and I in him. So what he's talking about is, is belief in him, putting our faith in him, trusting him, abiding in him, and allowing him to abide in us is what it means to eat this bread that God has provided, that is the bread of living bread of life that we will never die from. It's an invitation to come and trust him, to come at him, not in our own terms, but in his terms, approach him for who he is, not what we want him to be or mistakenly think he is. But when we do that, when we truly eat who he is and take that in us, you know, and it seems like a weird metaphor, but if you stop and think about the metaphor of eating and drinking, it's how we, we live, right? It's how we take in sustenance. It's how our bodies are nourished and grow strong and continue to live day after day. If you stop eating and drinking, you will die. And so Jesus is like, this spiritual life that I want to give you, you consume it, you take it into yourself, you, you nourish your spiritual self with this by believing in me and abiding in me. But no, I guarantee you, nobody in that synagogue, as that was the message that they heard, not even the disciples. Because we're told in verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, which is really diplomatic. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling, so not even his disciples are grumbling, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So he's inviting them to dig a little deeper and then ponder and meditate on what he's just taught. But there are some of you who don't believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who would not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to the Father unless it's, no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. It takes literally a miracle of God for us to recognize Jesus and be drawn to him. And that is as true today as it was at that time. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. Oh, they've chosen to eat and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And so, oh my goodness, I know that's a lot. It's a lot, and I might never do that again. Um, But I just wanted to show, like, the whole, what is is jam-packed into this one longish, but it's it's one scene of Jesus interacting. And you see what John is doing, just like he made chapter 5, is all about what it means How does Jesus redefine the Sabbath? This is all about Jesus redefining Passover. That's what this whole chapter is about. And Passover, remember, for the Jewish people, that is the definitive story. I mean, it's in that story that the word redemption first appears in, in the Hebrew Bible. And it's the first time that salvation first appears in the Hebrew Bible. And Moses is at the Red Sea, and he's like, you just be quiet and see the salvation of of the Lord and what he's going to do for you. I mean, that's the definitive redemption salvation story that they celebrate with a meal. And it's that meal. Why is that meal significant? One of the ways that's, that's your badge of community membership in the community of Israel. If you don't eat that meal, you're not part of the community and people that aren't part of the community don't get to eat that meal. That's, that's the badge of membership. And Jesus says, now there's a new badge, and that's eating and drinking me. If, when, if you abide in me and I abide in you, if you put your trust in me, the way that your fathers that you respect and admire in, in your Bible did in their lives, they put their trust in me. If you'll do the same, that's now 
the Passover meal that I'm inviting you to. And guess what, guys? We got 12 baskets here. The whole of Israel is still out there in the nations. Let's go get them. Like, that's the message he's trying to proclaim to them, and they're not getting it. That's, what, that's the, the mission that he's inviting them now to be a part of, to be a part of a new Exodus story, that they have a, a part to play they, in partnership with God, of not just putting Israel back together, but putting the whole world, the whole creation back together in its proper order under his kingship. So let's pray, and then we're going to take communion. We're going to break bread and drink the grape juice together with the words of Jesus fresh in our brain. That's going to be really cool. So Abba, we praise you. We thank you for how you have inspired your apostles with these scriptures, God, to to preserve these amazing words from our Messiah. So that even now, 2,000 years later, he can still, still speak to us directly in black and white or red and white, depending on your Bible. The words of life as he reveals himself to us. Jesus, you are the bread of life. And we are so sorry that we run after all kinds of other breads of this world that we eat and we eat and we eat and we eat and we're never satisfied. Lord, forgive us. Help us to, again, put our trust in you fresh tonight to come to you and eat of you the true living bread, to drink of you, to take your teaching, your character, your nature into ourselves. Give us, Lord, the mind of Christ that we could see one another and this broken world the way you do, that our hearts would be broken the way yours is, that we would be motivated to action the way you were in working this great salvation for us in Jesus. Lord, we don't want to miss our moment the way so many people that we see in the Gospels missed such a moment with you. Wake us up, shake us, God. Open our eyes to, to see you in the now and to hear your voice and what you are speaking to your church, all of us together, and what you're speaking to us individually, Lord. We want to know you better. We're so thankful to know you in Christ. We want to know you better, God, but we need your help to do that. Holy Spirit,